<laughs> Honey, I'm yeah. going to show you a trick. Okay, show me a trick. See the penny? I see the penny. I'll put this bottle of water right on top of the penny. Okay. And then we'll put this over it. Okay. And when I say the magic words, yeah. the penny's going to go inside the bottle. Really? Yes. Okay, let me see this happen. Okay. I got the tower. Boogie boogie. Boogie boogie. Boogity boogity. Boogity boogity. Okay. Now you look down in there and the penny's inside the bottle. Oh! I actually think my favorite part of that video is the lady laughing, and she's awesome, absolutely awesome. Um, you know, if you know Monica, then I think that you'd agree with me that I think I've just seen my future, and uh, you know, if you know my wife, uh, I think you have an idea what that might be all about. You know, sometimes life just throws us unexpected twists and turns, doesn't it? Um, I don't know if you heard about this. Um, our Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was recently in the Middle East and trying to do some uh, negotiating and trying to uh, help them come to some agreement for peace. And he found a, uh, a genie's lamp. This is a true story. Uh, he found a genie's lamp, began to rub that lamp, and of course out came a genie. Told you it's a true story, okay? And uh, so uh, the genie said, uh, for your reward for freeing me, I'm going to give you a wish. So Secretary Pompeo thought, this is my opportunity. He pulled out a map of the Middle East. And he said, my wish, genie, is that we would have peace in the Middle East. Well, the genie kind of rubbed his chin and said, you know, that's a tough one there. Uh, I don't know if even I can do that. He said, uh, let me give you another chance. So Secretary thought about it and says, okay, I would like for the Miami Dolphins to win the Super Bowl. <laughs> Suddenly the genie said, uh, let me take a look at that map once again. And uh, this time of year, when we see a lot of teams eliminated, my team's out. And uh, if you're a Dolphin fan, we're in a lot of common territory uh, on that one. You know, as we look at this new year, a lot of people are making New Year's resolutions. They're thinking about what this year may hold for them. Uh, I was talking to someone this morning. They said, I made a New Year's resolution that this year I wanted to lose 15 pounds. And they said, after only two weeks, I only have 25 more to go. And uh, you, you're, you're maybe off to that kind of a start. But, you know, as we look at this coming year, I was asking God to give me a message this morning to share with you that would allow us to get off to a good start this year. And rather than looking forward, God laid something in my heart actually looking backwards. You know, if Paul were alive today... I have to imagine that Paul would probably have a favorite team. He probably would uh, get the sports page, probably check out all the apps of his favorite teams to see the moves they're making regarding coaches and players and checking out the stats of his team. Why? Because many times in his books that he has written, he alludes to physical competition. He refers to sports back in the Bible days. You see, both the Greeks and the Romans were intently interested in sports, both for the purpose of individual physical fitness, but also for the honor of their towns and of their countries. And being a man of godly wisdom that he was, I personally think that Paul today would make great choices and be maybe a Green Bay Packer fan, a Chicago Cub fan, a Notre Dame fan, like all my teams that are really doing really, really bad right now. But in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 here, he alludes to a foot race. You see, back in these days, they would have arenas that would be filled watching different events and watching the competitions. And, and here in this passage, he alludes to a foot race in an arena. And he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy 
that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And quite often we hear our pastor, Tim, refer to the fact that we are free. In fact, the verse that I shared with the other service, Romans chapter 5, verse 1, says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. You see, God's plan for our lives is that we be freed up from all that could entangle us, be freed up from all the things that could enslave us or slow us down or hinder us in this race that we call life. As I was asking God to give me a message to share with you, I was reminded about a lady that I spoke to several years ago now. And she was telling me all about the, the problems and the relationship with her mother. And she started listing all these things that her mother had done that caused her severe hurt in her life. And the consequences that she's facing even today because of some of the things that her mother had done to her. And then there was something that she said that caused me to wonder, wait, is her mother still living? So I asked her, I said, is your mother still living? And she said, no, my mom's been dead for about 20 years, but her life today continues to torment me. Folks, I found that to be tragic. That this woman is just consumed with hurt, consumed with anger and resentment and bitterness towards someone that has not even walked this earth for the last 20 years. And folks, when we stop and think about it, as we look at this year coming up, 2019, and all the things that it can possess, I really truly believe before we can enjoy the potential of 2019, we have to deal with the things that are behind us first. In fact, in uh, my years of ministry, I found that after talking to people, uh, you know, personal counseling and dealing with people, by the time you wade through the smoke and mirrors, more than anything else, the root issue of what's going on in their lives either has to do with unresolved hurts in their lives or something in their past that they have done that they just can't forgive themselves for. You see here in this passage in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, let us throw off everything that hinders us. Let's throw off the sin that easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. You know what's neat about our church? is that we have so many different backgrounds. You're from different places. You're from different backgrounds. You've had different experiences. There are so many things that are diverse within our church family. But one thing that we all have in common is that we all have a past. Every one of us have a past. And this morning what God has laid on my heart is let's take a look at our past from two different perspectives. Number one, there may be some in here that struggle with their past because of something that someone has done to cause them pain. Someone that has come into their life and done something that is causing them struggles and difficulties and looking back and, reg and regretting those items and realizing if that person had that not done to me, if they had not done that done to me, I'd be so much happier today. I'd be so much better off today. I'd be so much healthier today. That may be where you're at today. Or there's another perspective of looking at our past. And that's why we may have people here this morning that as you look at your past, you're struggling forgiving yourself because of a mistake that's taken place in your life, because of a wrong choice. And there may be people that today are being affected still by a choice you made in the past, and you just can't forgive yourself. Because of something that you've allowed into your life or a choice you've made in your past. And folks, we've got to learn how to biblically manage our past or we'll have a difficult future. And we'll never accomplish the potential of enjoying life and having an effective life for Jesus Christ until we biblically deal with our past. Folks, get this. Because your past will always be your present until you learn to biblically deal with 
your past. And what a shame it is to watch people that they go through everyday life and they're still living in their past because of something that's either happened to them or because of something that they've done and their present is consumed with their past. Let me say that again. Your past will always be your present if you don't learn to biblically deal with your past. You see, some of you may have experienced maybe an unrealized hope or expectation. You went into a relationship or you went into a business endeavor or something happened, but you had expectations and you had hopes that were never, ever realized. And that led to hurt. And that had, brings about disappointment. And that can lead to resentment and then anger and even bitterness that is still possible to be harbored today years after that event has happened. Or perhaps you're here this morning and maybe because of a choice you've made in the past, because of a failure in your eyes in some way, there are people that are still struggling because of something, some area, some way where I just blew it. And folks, let's be honest about something. Sometimes, doesn't life just stink? If you'd agree with me, would you say amen? <laughs> Sometimes life is hard. Sometimes things happen to us and we say, why does this have to happen to me? And sometimes we look at our lives and look around and try to figure out how on earth did my life get here? Sometimes life just stinks. But again, your past will be your present until you learn how to biblically deal with the past. You know, just a couple of pages, a couple of verses down, rather, from this verse in Hebrews chapter 12, in verse 14 and 15, Paul says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. See to it that no one fails short, that no one falls short of the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and to defile many. The word peace here says make every effort to live in peace. The word peace in this passage literally means to have a lack or bring about an end of strife. Literally, in other words, Paul is saying, listen, live a life to where you are free from the distresses of life. That sounds wonderful, doesn't it? But easily done, yes or no? <laughs> Absolutely not. And because of that, we hang on to things. We hang on to our past. We hang on to those hurts that people bring into our life. And we say, I've got a right to feel that I, the way that I do. Or else we just can't forgive ourselves. And we keep beating ourselves up over and over and over again. And we go through life feeling defeated because I've made such a mistake. And there are people that are suffering because of me. And I just can't get over that. Well, folks, hanging on to that doesn't just affect us. It says that, that bitterness, that not forgiving others or not forgiving ourselves even, cannot just destroy us. But it says also that it will also destroy others around us. Notice the end of verse 15 where it says that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble in us and defile many referring to others. And God says hanging on to these things eventually will destroy your peace and even your life, and affect those that are the closest to us. You know, that's how a little sapling turns into a great and mighty oak tree. That oak tree, at one point, was not a mighty oak tree, but just a little sapling. How many have ever dealt with kudzu? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. It looks like one harmless little vine, and next thing you know, this is what you end up with. Kudzu just takes over everything and it chokes the very life out of anything that's in his presence. How many of you have ever perhaps weeded your landscaping? And the big weeds that are easy to pull up in the front there, you grab those and you pull them up and then you look back and further away, maybe behind something is a little tiny weed. You think, you know, that's just way, that's too far out there. It's kind of out of the way. I'm not going to really worry about that and you let it go. Isn't that the one that grows into this monster that takes over all your landscaping? And see, it's those little roots that God says deal with them when they're little. Take care of them while they're small. 
Because if we're not careful, we'll end up with a life full of kudzu in our lives that just takes over everything. And one thing about deep-seated hurts, they don't just go away, do they? And there's nothing about the passing of time to where how many years have gone by and therefore it should be gone. No, that, uh, it's got a way of just taking over our lives and never letting go. And if you've done something in your past that you're still struggling with, you can look back at that thing and say, maybe if enough time goes by, I'll forget about it. It doesn't happen. In fact, just the opposite. It can take over more and more of a person's life until that person eventually can even be defined by their unresolved hurts or by their unresolved errors in their lives. You see, Mark 10, 45 says, For the mouth speaks, or our actions become what the heart is full of. Let me say that again. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. In other words, whatever, is full, whatever my heart is full of are the words that I'm going to speak. Are they going to be the actions that I produce? How many times have you ever talked to someone that says, I am never going to be like that person? And let's use a mother just for example's sake. I am never going to be like my mom. And they go through their life, I'm not going to be like my mom. I'm not going to be like my mom. And years later, who do they end up being just like? Who? Their mom. Their mom. And they become the very thing that they vow they're not going to be like. Why is that? Because Mark 10, 45 says, for the mouth speaks, our actions become what our heart is full of. And if a heart is full of even saying, I'm not going to be like that, I'm not going to be like that, I'm not, we eventually become whatever's in our heart. Because the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. <laughs> I was sharing a Bible study when I was pastoring in Georgia at one point. The same idea, the same principle, and had this good old boy raise his hand in the back. He says, Brother Craig. I know what you mean. He said, when I was a boy, my dad used to tell me whatever's in the well comes up in the bucket. You know, you think about that, and that'll preach, won't it? Whatever's in the well is what comes up in the bucket. Whatever is in our heart is what our life is going to produce. And I talk to people that say, Craig, I just can't get victory over my actions. I just can't stop doing it. You know what? It's not a problem of actions. It's a problem of the heart. And by the way, that's got a very positive, hopeful message as well. You want to become more like Christ? You want to be more like Jesus? How do we do that? We focus on him. We meditate on him. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I won't sin against God. And, and we apply God's word to our hearts. We meditate. We think it. We read it. We, we go over it. And what happens? We become what our heart is full of. There's a very positive thing about that. And because God says bitterness will rob us of our joy, he says in Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, to get rid of all bitterness, get rid of rage, get rid of anger, brawling and slander along with every force of malice, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ, just as in Christ God has forgiven you. But how do we do that? I would, you, know, you may be here saying, I would love to get rid of my past hurts. I would love to be able to forgive myself for some of the past mistakes I made, but how do I do that? Well, Paul gives us some very clear instructions here in this passage. Hebrews here, here in Hebrews chapter 12, he says, first of all, in verse 1, the first thing we need to do is to look at the overcomers. To look at the overcomers. Hebrews 12, 1 again says, therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us. I had a college professor, and he said, whenever you see the word therefore in Scripture, you need to find out what it's there for. And when Paul says here in Hebrews chapter 1, that since we are surrounded by such a great a cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us, the word therefore is there for a reason. And it's a transitional word to take us from Hebrews chapter 11 to Hebrews chapter 12. You say, what's in Hebrews chapter 11? Well, Hebrews chapter 11 is what many have called the hall of faith. And it lists for us these Old Testament spiritual heroes. People that demonstrated great faith and that God used in amazingly wonderful ways. So in Hebrews chapter 1, when it says, therefore... 
Because we have all these uh, cloud of witnesses, these people in Hebrews 11, let us throw off everything. What does that mean? And you may be here this morning and you might be thinking, but Craig, if you understood how deeply that person hurt me, or Craig, if you understood or if you knew what I've done in my past, you would understand why I can't move forward. But you know what? We look at Hebrews chapter 11 and say, you know what, folks? Maybe I don't understand what you've been through. But what's neat is that these people here in Hebrews 11 sure did. Are you having problems with the sibling? Well, Abel was killed by his brother. Anyone here been killed by your brother yet? (laughs) You've got problems with your family. Man, Abel knew what that was all about. You feel lonely like you're the only one around you that's trying to do right. Enoch lived that way for 365 years. You ever feel misunderstood and has that caused hurt in your life? Imagine how Noah felt with all those years building that ark and everybody making fun of him. You ever feel like God wasn't there for you or that God hasn't answered your prayers? Abraham and Sarah waited a hundred years for God to give them their prayer request. You ever experience hurt because of being lied about? Being betrayed by those that you should love and that should love you the most? Joseph, mentioned in Hebrews 11 also, was sold by his very brothers. He was thrown into a pit and then sold as a slave. Folks, he understands what we go through. Uh, you ever suffer for trying to do right? Have you ever tried to, to help people and they just turn on you? Moses is listed in Hebrews after, and that's just a couple of them. You see, Hebrews chapter 11 is full of people that can give you and I hope. As we stop and realize these hurts I've gone through, I need someone to understand that people in Hebrews 11 do. Well, you might be here this morning and thinking, but you you don't understand what I've done. You don't understand the hurt that I've caused other people. You don't understand how big of a mistake I've made in the past. Folks, you read through Hebrews chapter 11, it just doesn't talk about their good things they did, but there are stories of people there. Some of those heroes of the faith had horrible moral failures. They murdered people in a couple of cases. And folks, here's my point. We can look at the overcomers and say maybe, Craig, you don't understand, but we can say, but you know what? Those overcomers in Hebrews chapter 11 do understand. And there's no way I can ever try to minimize what you've experienced, but God has given us examples that are held up in front of us to where we can see, you know what, these are heroes of the faith, but they still had their warts and blemishes. They still experienced hurts. They hurt other people at times, but you know what, they overcame it. And today we know them and, uh, as, as people that overcame, and if they can overcome, then folks, so can we. He said, not only can we, number one, look at the overcomers, but Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the end of the verse, says that we can also look at ourselves. You ever feel like the guys in this video? They might be missing the boat. (laughs) But folks, you ever feel like you're just spinning your wheel sometimes? And you want to accomplish all that God has for you. You want to enjoy this life. You want to have peace and joy in your heart. But no matter what you do, it just seems like you're just spinning your wheels. See, verse 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 1, ends by saying, and let us. Paul makes it personal now. He said, let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out before us. And Paul's looking at his life here in Philippians chapter 3, and he looks at where he'd come from. Paul's kind of taking a step back in Philippians chapter 3, and he says, you know, I want to take a look back at where I've been, where I'm at, and then where I'm going. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, Paul says, listen, I'm not there yet. Paul says, I've not arrived. He says, I'm I'm not Christ-like yet. But he does say in Philippians 3, 12, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. But he says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. I've not arrived. 
But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. He said, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. When I was in high school, I enjoyed playing sports and Primarily, I played football in the fall, played soccer in the wintertime, and then played baseball in the spring. And I uh, had just, a, no, just a, a moment of insanity, and I decided one year I would run track. How many of you have ever run track in high school? Can I see your hands? What is wrong with you people? <laughs> you see, in football, you run and you condition to get ready for the what? The game. In soccer, you run and you condition to get ready for the match. In, in, in uh, uh, track, you run so you can get ready to what? To run some more. And I promised myself I would not quit, but that was a miserable experience for me. I hated it, could not wait till the last meet of the year and say, I'm going back to baseball next year. But during our conditioning, we did something, and we used something called uh, ankle weights. And we would use these weights, we put them around our legs, and they would strengthen us, and they'd build our endurance, and it would help us be more effective in running when it comes to the meets. But folks, there is a time when it's time to take these off. And that's when it's time for the what? For the race. You'd be foolish to run the race with these weights around your ankle. They would slow you down and make you horribly ineffective. So there's a time when it's time to put those aside. And folks, my challenge to you this morning is this. Wouldn't today be a wonderful day if we got to the point to say it's time for me to listen to Paul and to put aside the weight of my past? As a child, I was raised in South Bend, Indiana. We lived about a half a mile away from the University of Notre Dame. People would walk, uh, they would park in the street in front of our house. That's how closely we were to the campus. And uh, I grew up in a church called uh, First Baptist Church in Mishawaka, Indiana, and uh, had a wonderful children's director when I was a child. And uh, I will say that I was probably the most energetic child in our whole children's department. I was that child when I walked in the back door, the children's workers would say, oh no, he's here. And uh, uh, just uh, the headaches I caused my uh, children's workers when I was a kid. And they had this church that uh, was built in different stages. And this church uh, didn't have a master plan, as it were. So they built one building based on need, and then they built another building, and then they had hallways that led from one to the other. Then they built another uh, building based on need. And so what you had was a bunch of buildings separated by all these tunnels and hallways, and we found some secret passages when we were kids. And we would go explore all throughout the church and find these dark tunnels and places that used to be rooms, and now they're just cut off. And we had more fun exploring the church. Well, a couple of years ago, my wife Monica and I went up to South Bend, Indiana, and uh, we decided to go look at the church where I was raised as a kid, and I was wondering what those hallways look like today. Have you ever gone back to your home where you grew up as a kid, and you looked at that mountain that all of a sudden didn't look as big anymore? You know what I'm talking about? And that, that hill that used to sled down that used to look like Mount Everest, and all of a sudden you realize, who tore down that hill? And you realize it's just not as big as you remember it being. Well, we, went, we were looking in all these dark hallways, and I'd open the door, and, and uh, they're still scary and creepy looking even to this day. Just dark tunnels. And I was reminiscing, thinking back of what a wonderful childhood I had. Uh, we had a, a, just an amazing uh, group of friends when I was uh, growing up in South Bend. We uh, were, lived in a neighborhood to where our home was one of the first ones built. In the community. So there were lots of homes that were being built that dig out basements, and all the piles of dirt from the basements would be piled around the hole in the ground. And my friends and I thought it was really cool to go to these piles of dirt and to play war. And we would take turns getting on different hilltops, and we'd get these dirt bombs, which really they were as hard as rock, and we'd throw them at each other from one hill to the other. And I remember getting hit in the shoulder one time. How we didn't kill ourselves, I will never know. Uh, it's good to be with you folks this morning. I shouldn't be, okay? But as much fun as it was going back and looking back at those places and reminiscing about my childhood, I realized something, that I don't live there anymore. My home is now in Stewart, 
I'm in a different phase of my life. I'm doing what God has called me to do in a different place, in a different way, in a different manner, and I don't live there anymore. And folks, God's plan for every one of us is that, no, we never forget our memories because God wants to use our past in an amazing way for his glory, actually. But we also can experience victory in realizing that I don't live in my past anymore. And folks, it'd be wonderful if we could leave this place and no longer being captive to our past, whether things we've been hurt by or maybe things we've done that we've not been able to forgive ourselves for. And folks, we can do that. Romans 8.37 says that with his help in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. John 15.5 reads, apart from me, you can do nothing but. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And folks, instead of being relegated to the role of a victim to our past, whatever that may be, we can become a victor over it. And Paul tells us in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, not only can we be, first of all, overcomers, but we can, by, by looking at the overcomers, but we can also look at ourselves. But he also says to look to Jesus. So how do we do that? We, we're overcome, we look at the overcomers, we look at ourselves, and then we look to Jesus. And he says here in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2, 2, and 4, it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer or the originator, and the perfecter or the finisher of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He scorned its shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And the word look here is an attitude. It's not talking about a one-time glance where we look at Jesus and then look away. It's talking about an attitude of keeping our focus on Jesus. And the writer of Hebrews emphasizes the importance of a future hope. Why? Because the people that read this book back in the Bible days were going through a tough, tough time. They were suffering. And they were not yet dying for the cause of Christ. But they were making their lives miserable. And many times they would look at their past and they would look back and say, you know, we had it better in our past. They were looking back towards their past. And so Paul says to them, hey, instead of looking at your past, how good you think you had it, instead, look at Jesus. And look what he went through. And even I love this idea. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. Speaking of Jesus, says we don't have a high priest talking about Jesus who cannot be touched by the things we go through. But he was in every way tempted or tested like as we are. In other words, think about this. Everything that you and I go through, Jesus went through this on this earth. You think about the experiences of Jesus, and he was misunderstood. He was lied about. He was mistreated. He was accusations thrown in his direction that he didn't deserve. He experienced all these hurts. And therefore, we can look at Jesus, and, and folks, we never, we have a God that we never have to say, God, you don't know what it's like to be me. God, you don't understand what I'm going through because you're God. You don't get it. No, he does get it. Because he was tested in every way like you and me, and he passed every test. And every feeling, every emotion we will ever experience in our lives, he experienced it. And I love this principle here, where we can actually look at Jesus, and we can get tremendous hope by looking at his life and his example. In fact, you remember the story when Jesus was on the cross? And he had just been hurt on a level that none of us will ever, ever be hurt. And he looked at those people hanging from the cross that just put him through all of that pain and suffering and hurt. And he looked at those very people and said, what? Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. You see, we have a God who understands what we're going through. We have a God who understands hurts. We have a God that says, you can come to me because I've been there and I've done that and I want to be there for you when you go through those difficult times. 
We won't take the time to look at the whole passage of Scripture. But I love in Romans chapter 8 and 29, and verse 28 and 29, where it promises that you and I can be more than conquerors through him that loved us. And folks, when it comes down to it, there really is only one cure for us dealing with our past. The only helpful path for our hurtful past is forgiveness. The same thing that Jesus did on the cross, choosing to forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Folks, that's the only way you and I will ever have peace. That's the only way you and I will be able to move on from our past to live that wonderful, blessed, happy, peaceful life that God desires for us. And the same way that Jesus said from the cross, I choose to forgive them because they don't understand what they're doing. You know the strange thing about bitterness? Is that sometimes the people that hurt us aren't even aware of it. And you've known people, as I have, that will go through their lives and they're hanging on to something and they're hanging on to it and they're hanging on to it and that person doesn't even realize what they did. They're going about their merry little life and have no idea the pain that they have put someone through. They have no idea the consequences years later. And folks, they may never come to us and offer their apology. They may never come up to us and say, man, I am really sorry for what I did to you. I shouldn't have done that, and, I, and I'm sure it probably had consequences. Can you please find it in your heart to forgive me? I'll do whatever I've got to do to make it right. That may never happen. But folks, forgiveness is an attitude on our part. There where we can say, you know what, I choose to let that go. I choose to no longer let that affect who I am. Joe, would you come up here for just a second? I've asked Joe if you'd help me with, a, uh, with an illustration. And because of that, Matthew 18, 35 says, Forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Colossians 3, 13, Bear with each other. Forgive one another. If any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. See, back in the Bible days, they would have a ledger up here, Joe. They would have a ledger keeping track of their debts. And on that ledger, it would list how much money that person borrowed from me, when they borrowed the money from me, and when they're promising to pay it back again. So let's say if Joe borrowed $5 from me, I would have on my ledger that Joe on such and such a date borrowed $5. He agrees to pay it on this certain date. So I'd go to Joe on that day and say, Joe, uh, do you have my $5? And Joe would say, no, I don't. Okay, we'll catch you next week. So I just leave it on the ledger. Next week comes up, Joe, do you have my $5? Joe would say, no, I don't. And Joe is a friend of mine. And eventually, week after week after week, I finally realized that this $5 is beginning to affect our relationship. It's making him uncomfortable. It's making me a little frustrated. So there comes a point to where, you know what? I am tired of this $5 getting in the way of my relationship, my friendship with Joe. So I'm going to take my pen and I choose to scratch off his line. And I choose to no longer hold Joe responsible for what he has done. And I let him off the hook. Thank you. You can be seated. Folks, in the New Testament, that's exactly what forgiveness is. It's the choosing on my own doing that whatever, whoever that person may be that's on that ledger, Whoever it is that's caused you hurt, whoever you have in your life that you feel like, I've got, a, I've got a right to be upset, I've got a right to be hurt, I've got a right to hang on to that, coming to the point to where eventually realize, you know what, it's not worth it. It's not worth carrying that anymore. And we take our proverbial pen and we scratch off that name and we choose to no longer hold them responsible. Now, folks, as you know, That doesn't mean it's going to go away forever. Forgiveness is not necessarily a one-time act, but it's a process. It's a continual attitude of I choose to forgive, and I promise you something, that will come back to your mind if the hurt is deep-seated. And choosing to forgive again, and choosing to forgive again, and again, and again, over and over and over again. Folks, let me ask you this question. Who this morning in your ledger has got their name in your book? 
In other words, who this morning can you look at and say, you know what, Craig? I've got a right to be upset at that person. That person has hurt me. That person has affected me. That person has done something to where I'm not the same today because of who that person is and what they did to me. Maybe if you look at your ledger, maybe your own name is in there. Maybe you look at your own name and say, Craig, I have hurt somebody so deeply. I've made some wrong choices in my life, and I've had some failures in my life. And even to this day, there are people that may be suffering because of a choice I made. Maybe you're here this morning, and you need to scratch off your own name and finally forgive yourself and let yourself off the hook. See, what's neat about that is in Hebrews, rather, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18 and 19, Isaiah says, forget the former things. Now, folks, I'm not saying that we'll ever blot that completely from our memory. But we can forget in terms of we can live our lives as if that didn't happen. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. He says, see, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Jeremiah does something kind of cool in eight, uh, Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah goes to the potter's house. How many of you how many have ever been to like a working farm or working like uh, yesterday your village to where you see some of the old crafts in action you ever see a potter's wheel and they take that clay and they put it on the potter's wheel and they begin to mold it and they begin to fashion it and eventually it takes shape and what the uh, potter imagines in his mind eventually is happening in his hands well jeremiah 18 verse 4 he said he went to the potter's house but the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands we don't know what happened. Maybe it collapsed in itself. Maybe something broke. Maybe there was a crack in it. And he says, because it was marred, the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to him. And what I love about this passage of Scripture is that God wants us to put our lives on his potter's wheel and let God be the potter. We're the clay. He's the potter and letting God mold and make our lives into whatever he wants it to be. And folks, when we mar the, the vase, when we either experience hurt or when we do things, just like the story here, the pot was marred. He didn't take that clay, throw it out and start all over again. But he took that same clay and started all over again. He took that clay, same clay, made it into another pile and began to mold it all over again. And folks, that's exactly what God wants to do with our lives. He wants to take whatever's broken, whatever's marred in your life and in my life and fashion it again as it seems best to him. Let me close with the simple thought. I said earlier that one thing we all have in common is that we all have a past. But there's something else we all have in common, and that's that we all have a story. We all have a story. And that story is an opportunity of instead of living in the guilt of our past, or instead of living in the anger and the bitterness and the failures of our past, God says, listen, I can take you and make you a new creature. God says, I can take you, put you back on my wheel again, and I can use your past as part of your story of how an amazing God can take a mess and make something valuable out of it. Folks, my prayer for you this morning, as each one of us come to the point of being able to say, my past happened. My past is my past. My past can be part of my beautiful story for God's glory, but I don't live there anymore. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. And in the quietness of this moment, let me just ask each of us if we'll just consider who is in my past that needs to be forgiven? Who is in my past that I need to take that ledger and scratch off a name and no longer hold them responsible? Let's leave this place this morning with a brand new peace because of choosing not to live in our past. Father, as we come to you this morning, we thank you for your transforming power. 
We thank you, Father, for just being so amazing that you could take our lives and fashion it and make something of it. And Lord, I thank you that you're aware of every facet and every detail of each of our past. And Father, thank you that you've given us the opportunity of being able to put our past behind us and moving forward and letting our past become part of the narrative of what a transforming work you're capable of doing in each of our lives. Father, I come to you this morning asking you to help us to have the courage and the boldness to take difficult steps in order to experience all that you have for our lives. And we'll give you the honor, the praise, and the glory for it. Amen. Let's all stand together. Pick me. 